Good afternoon. I'm Elsa Connect, and I'm the Deputy Director of Public Policy for the National Center for Victims of Crime. And I want to welcome you to today's webinar, Recovering Forensic DNA Evidence from Crime Scenes. And we have our final participants logging in right now, so I'll just go over a few housekeeping issues while we're waiting for them to uh, get logged on. I want to make a note that uh, in your email you got from the WebEx um, system that reminded you about the webinar today, we mentioned that the slides for today's webinar would be on the website for download. And we apologize that um, we had trouble getting those onto the website before the webinar started. So those will be posted after the webinar um, for you to to download and um, in fact we are recording this uh, webinar today and that link to the recording will be up there also. Um, it will take us a couple of days to get that up there but the PowerPoint slides should hopefully be up by later today so we apologize about that. Um, to, uh, this is uh, actually just for people who are having trouble uh, logging in to the audio today. Um, and if you have any, I just want to say if you have any technical issues during the webinar, you should just contact WebEx support at 866-229-3239. I want to let everybody know that all participants are um, muted today upon entry to the call. So you will not be able to ask a question verbally, but we do have um, a question and answer tool in WebEx that you can use to send us a question. So I'm going to go to um, the full screen view for just a minute here and let you see where that um, question answer tool is. If you look at the bottom right hand corner of your screen, you'll see a little floating toolbar there. And you can click on the question mark icon and you'll be able to, um, that will open the question and answer toolbar. And back in split screen view, some of you may have your screen like this during the webinar. Um, the toolbar is also on the right-hand side. It's uh, maybe minimized for you, so you'll have to, to click on the little arrow right next to where it says Q&A, and that'll also open that uh, question and answer panel. Um, if you want to ask a question, you just type into the little box under the uh, question and answer toolbar and hit send. Make sure you hit send or we won't get the, the question. Um, your questions are not seen by anyone else on the call, just by the panelists, just so you know. And we're going to do our, our best to answer all questions today at the end of the presentation, but if we do not get to your question today, we will be following up with everyone by email. You may have noticed on the right side of your screen that we are taking a poll. Um, we hope everyone got a chance to complete this so far. We're going we're gonna to close it in a few minutes, so you have a few more minutes if you can try to complete that before we close it, that would be great. And again, don't forget to hit submit to send us your answers. Okay. The National Center for Victims of Crime is very pleased to bring you this webinar today with the support of Applied Biosystems. Applied Biosystems is a DNA technology company that has graciously supported our work to increase knowledge of DNA, how DNA technology can be used to assist criminal investigations. This is the fourth webinar in a series of six. More information is available on our website. Um, coming up in April, we have Using DNA to Solve Missing Persons and Homicide Cases, and in May, we will have a webinar on Solving Cold Cases. So I want to take just a minute to tell you a little bit about the National Center before I turn the webinar over to our presenter. The National Center's mission is to forge a national commitment to help victims of crime rebuild their lives. And we do this through direct support to all victims of crime on our National Crime Victim Helpline, 1-800-FYI-CALL. We provide training and technical assistance to those who work with victims of crime through our Stalking Resource Center and our Teen Victim Project. And we also work on Capitol Hill to ensure funding for victims uh, servicing programs, um, law enforcement funding, including um, we have done a lot of work on um, making sure that the Debbie Smith Act funds are appropriated every year. The National Center uh, is working to maximize the use of DNA technology because it's important to victims. Since about 2002, the National Center has been focusing on increasing understanding of forensic DNA and DNA technology because we know that if we, pr we can prevent more crime, we can solve more cases by increasing the use of forensic DNA and DNA databases. And of course, um, that's good for not only victims, but for the public in general. Our DNA work 
includes trainings. Um, we have a DNA uh, training, two-day training coming up in May, and that's geared towards victim service providers, but really um, for anyone who works with victims will be a, a great um, training. And we'll be holding more in-person trainings um, in the fall of next year. And of course, we have uh, more webinars coming up. We host a listserv for those who are interested in DNA-related issues. And we have developed materials about forensic DNA for victims and professionals who, other professionals who work with victims. So this is the web address for our online DNA Resource Center website, and all the materials that I mentioned and all the announcements about trainings and webinars will be on, um, are on this website. Um, this is my contact information if you want to email me with any questions um, or if you would like to join our DNA Answers listserv, I can sign you up for that, and our website again there at the top. Okay. And I want to say that we have about 160 people on the call right now. Um, we're going to get, we're going to close the poll here in just a second. I'm going to delay for a minute so that we can get um, a few more answers to that before we close it. Looks like people are still trying to take it. <laughs> um, so I'm actually going to go ahead and uh, introduce Joe. We might hold that poll there for just a minute. Um, we're really excited about this webinar today because we have a great topic and we have a great speaker. I really actually can't do um, his resume justice, um, but I'm going to try. Uh, Detective Sergeant Joseph Blosis retired last year from the New York Police Department where he worked for almost 30 years, 13 of those years as a senior sergeant in the crime scene unit where he managed more than 2,500 crime scenes, including more than 1,000 homicide investigations. His duties included the supervision of the search, collection, preservation, and documentation of all types of physical and trace evidence. In 1993 and 2001, he oversaw both crime scene investigations involving the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center. Prior positions include working in a detective squad as plainclothes anti-crime and as a uniformed patrol officer. Before his retirement, Joe was the coordinator of the New York Police Department's Biotrax DNA program where he used his crime scene expertise to train field personnel in the recognition, detection, documentation, and recovery of DNA evidence in property crime cases. He is certified in New York State for method of instruction and has conducted and participated in numerous training sessions and lectures, including the FBI's Death Investigation Course in Quantico, Virginia, and the Department of Justice's International Criminal Investigative Training Assistance Program. It looks like now um, we are going to close the poll and hand control over to Joe. I want to let you know that, that Joe is a, is a true New Yorker. He talks really fast. Um, <laughs> he, have, he does have a lot of information to cover, but um, he's a wonderful speaker, and we're really excited to have him with us today. So welcome to us, Joe. Uh, before I begin, I'd just like to thank uh, I'd like to thank Applied Biosystems and uh, obviously uh, NCVC for giving me the opportunity here to, uh, uh, to speak today. And more importantly, or equally as important, I'd like to thank the participants that, uh, that registered for this uh, webinar and who are also uh, uh, subsequently online right now to uh, uh, go over uh, DNA evidence collection with me. Um, Yes, I do speak uh, quite quickly. I could probably, uh, the old saying, I, I, I talk a New York minute, and I'm going to try to consciously slow myself down here a little bit. But there's a ton of information that I like to get out, and one of the problems is, is, is always time. So uh, basically, we have about 40 minutes to go through approximately uh, 80 slides. And uh, obviously, uh, I, I'd like to spend uh, more time on some of the more important information and less time on the others. Uh, I was uh, really overwhelmed by the, uh, the amount of participants that uh, signed up for this event. And I'm hoping that the cross-section of you, um, I'm hoping that we have a, a bulk of uh, maybe new evidence collectors, new crime scene personnel that recently rented, uh, entered their, uh, their units. And if we have uh, seasoned veterans in there, that's fine too. And I hope to possibly uh, refine or make you remember some past things that maybe you're overlooking now. And because of ASCLAD uh, accreditations in uh, in laboratories and in crime scene units, uh, maybe it'll be a quick reminder that maybe you should get back to doing the uh, proper uh, evidence uh, 
proper evidence collection uh, procedures. So before I get into the actual presentation, I just want to give you a little bit of background. Last December, we did a, uh, a webinar very similar to this, which was, uh, again, uh, extremely um, well uh, represented, and we did property crimes, property crimes and DNA. And now today we decided that we're going to look at the actual DNA evidence collection. And that's what my main focus is today, is going to actually be the crime scene investigation, in particular uh, DNA recognition, documentation, collection, and transfer. Um, we're going to start off basically with uh, uh, entering the crime scene. I'm going to go over first responders' responsibilities, and we're going to take it through the entire investigation. Uh, once again, Elsie gave me that, that nice uh, introduction, and this is my name. If I can help any of you down the road for whatever question uh, you may have or whatever, my contact information will be provided uh, at the end of the presentation. Okay, we're going to first start off by... Okay, I just got it back uh, back on it. The polling it. thing. Okay, here we go. Yeah, okay. I apologize for that. It straightened itself out. What we're going to do is we're going to start off with crime scene DNA investigation, and basically right now we're looking at uh, two parts of slides concerning this. We're going to be looking at the safeguarding of the crime scene. We're going to be discussing proper protective equipment. We're going to be talking about establishing a tactical plan and documentation of the crime scene, recognition of biological and touch, transfer, contact DNA evidence, whatever term you may uh, like to use. And from there, we're also going to be doing our And once again, my apologies. What's, are you having trouble with the slide, Joe? Yeah, I'm having trouble advancing, Elsie. Oh, dear. Okay. And Hold on. Let me see if I can do it for you. It's not working? Oh, there we okay, go. It's going now. Yep, it's going. It's just okay. taking a little time. For Is that time. something that you just did? No, I think it's just taking oh, it's in a the little system? time. Okay. Yeah. So again, my apologies. Crime scene DNA, uh, and also continuing from what I just had on the previous slide, we're going to be discussing the collection of DNA evidence, its packaging, elimination of banded samples, evidence storage, and uh, basic uh, courtroom testimony uh, to sum everything up. Crime scene DNA investigation. We can even probably omit DNA, basic crime scene investigation. You must document the scene. You must, uh, you're, you're going to collect your evidence at the scene, and you're going to have your crime scene reconstruction. Your documentation, obviously, for the personnel that have been out there for uh, quite a while, you document the scene through photographs, note-taking, reports, measurements, and sketches. Your photographs, basically, this is obviously for, um, Crime Scene 101 with photography. You're going to start off with your overalls, mid-range, your close-ups, and your macros. And that's basically for all your crime scene uh, documentation. No matter what uh, the size of the scene is, secondary scenes, whatever it is, this is your basic format to document the overall scene and, in particular, the evidence that you're collecting at the scenes. Your sketches are basically two types of sketches. You have your rough sketches that you take at the scene right on your uh, clipboard, taking them with graph paper, note paper, whatever you may have, and basically you're going to transpose those sketches into a final sketch back at the office. Through the years, um, different agencies such as mine and other agencies, you can use Crime Zone. From Crime Zone, we, are, we are added Total Station. From Total Station now, you're looking at, the, at, at 3D imaging, which will reconstruct from a uh, 3D perspective uh, the entire crime scene, which these uh, items are absolutely fa fabulous to use. Um, if your if departments have the ability to purchase and to look at these items, I would strongly uh, suggest that you would uh, at least give it a look-see. If anyone needs information on this stuff down the road, you can always call me. I can give any inside scoop on how these different items work. But bottom line, rough sketching into a final handwritten sketch is fine. Um, number two is if you have and use whatever computer software program your department is using, Obviously, that's, that's, that's fine as well, too. 
DNA collection. It's very simple. We're going to be searching for the evidence. We're going to collect that evidence. We're going to record the evidence. We're going to initial the evidence. We're going to package that evidence and prepare it and transport it to whatever uh, laboratory uh, deemed necessary. As far as crime scene reconstruction, we're looking at basic crime scene reconstruction. We're going to read that scene. We want to be able to analyze the scene. We want to look to and, and determine at that scene what is in that scene that's not supposed to be there, what is supposed to be there, and that's been removed from the scene. We're also going to look at basic blood spatter interpretation. And to put this into a nutshell, we're going to be primarily interested in blood direct, uh, directionality. We'd like to document that. We'd like to uh, document different patterns and so forth and so on. I'm sure everybody's familiar with these different types of uh, spatter uh, interpretations analysis. Uh, this is just the basic ones that should be done at the scene. If a blood spatter interpretation in, uh, uh, was uh, a, a big part of the case, obviously you would do a, a full-blown uh, blood spatter reconstruction on it, which is time-consuming, and I'm sure people in the field realize how, uh, how detailed of that, that would be. But basically, at the, uh, at the average crime scene, we're looking at directionality to assist us, and that's the blood droplings to help us determine the movements of uh, the victim and the uh, suspects. Safeguarding the crime scene. This is, where the, this is where it all begins, right here at the crime scene. If this crime scene is compromised, no matter what all the sophisticated uh, instrumentation there are now in DNA labs and all the... Uh, the scientists that work in these labs, the forensic scientists, if the evidence is compromised or missed at the crime scene, the, the case is virtually uh, down the tubes. And therefore, we must safeguard that crime scene, and that begins with the responsibilities of the first responders. First responders go into crime scene, safety first. Uh, you can't drive 100 miles an hour with your lights and silen uh, sirens blasting, and God forbid if you get in a traffic accident, hit a tree, if you don't make it to the scene, you're not doing it yourselves any good. You've got to be careful arriving at the scene. You've got to be cognizant of when you're entering the close proximity of the scene, who's exiting the scene, suspicious vehicles, suspicious persons, and so forth and so on. Obviously, the first uh, responders, they must be, uh, their first responsibilities will be to render aid to the victim if they are all on site. We're going to look to preserve and safeguard that crime scene by many different procedures that are out there, but basically the first responder is going to notify their bosses, their patrol sergeants, their patrol lieutenants to respond. They're going to erect the crime scene. Bottom line is keep it nice and simple. Don't let anybody in. Don't let any and, and don't let anybody in. And while you're in there, you try to keep it to the minimum as far as, far as the first responders. Going back to safety, once you're in that scene. You got to make sure that the scene is safe for everyone. What do I mean by that is make sure that there's no other suspects hiding in that location. It's happened before and it happens too many times. They're up in ceilings, they're secreted in closets, under beds, and so forth and so on. You try to do the search as cautiously as you can. Safety first at this point, crime scene second. Once that scene is deemed, now deemed safe, we're going to establish our crime scene tape. We always like to make crime scenes bigger versus uh, larger versus smaller. And we are at this point is we're going to assign an officer or officers to make sure no one enters this crime scene. If we have witnesses and complainants at the scene, we'd like to separate them. We'll take statements. We'll ask the, for their, um, we'd like to bring them back to the station house. If uh, they refuse, we have to get at least contact information for the detectives to follow up. First responders, Right off the bat, chain of custody, you will be testifying in court as far as the uh, safeguarding of the scene and ev any evidence that you may have uh, actually recovered from that scene. We're going to assess the perimeter of the crime scene. We have to be very cognizant of secondary scenes, which are very, very common. We want to confer with other law enforcement pers personnel that may have been there uh, prior to your arrival, prior to after that scene is deemed safe and we know what we have. Personal protective equipment is a must, and we'll be uh, getting into uh, PPE in a few moments. We have to be cognizant now is once we evaluate the scene as, an, as a crime scene that's going to require forensic processing, we'd like to utilize the same path in and, and the same path out to minimize any type of uh, evidence um, uh, contamination. 
Bottom line is low cards theory of evidence transference. Whenever you enter a crime scene, you're going to leave something in that crime scene. Anytime you exit the crime scene, you're going to be removing a part of that crime scene somehow, some way. You want to establish a tactical plan. What do I have here? What's more, what's more important than some other things, such as probative versus non-probative evidence? What type of biological evidence may I have? What type of other DNA touch evidence may I have? Firearms-related uh, evidence, ballistic shells, whatever. You may also have uh, numerous other different types of trace evidence. You may have a body on the scene. You may not have a, a body on the scene. Bottom line is you're going to have to try to establish a sequential a detailed method of how you're going to approach this scene and what evidence is going to be collected in what type of manner and proceed to the next. Bottom line to this is if I have a blood job, I'm not, I know I'm going to be collecting my blood samples. I know I have to let my blood samples air dry prior to packaging. So I probably, I may do blood first, let it air dry in a, in a, a secluded, uh, non-contaminated area and then I may proceed with uh, another form of evidence. If there's a body on the scene and I know I have the coroner coming and I have ballistics uh, encircling the body, I may end up doing the ballistics first. So depending what you have at that scene, you have to do your technical plan first. Personal protective uh, equipment, pretty easy. We're wearing these gowns that cover not only your feet with booties, but they have the gowns such as Tyvex. There's uh, numerous other companies that have them. Uh, they include boots your full uh, uh, jump wear, gloves, mask, hood, and at times eye protection. Recovering DNA evidence, sources of DNA evidence. Basically, whatever comes from your body is potential DNA evidence. Blood, semen, saliva, skin tissue, dandruff, bones, teeth, nails, hair, earwax, vaginal cells, rectal urine, feces, sweat. This will all give you DNA. If we have enough DNA, it would yield a profile. Back in the 1980s, it would be as if you were to give a biological sample, such as blood, the size of a quarter or a dime, they'd be able to provide the lab. The forensic laboratory would be able to be, provide you a DNA profile. In the 90s, through technology and advancements in instrumentation, we are able to reduce that size from a dime to barely visible. Currently today, touch DNA, 10 to 20 skin cells will give you a, it's possible to give you a DNA profile. So if you really think about that, forget about your blood. We're looking at about 20 skin cells, which you cannot see, but skin cells are deposited at a crime scene. And we have to, and it's our job to do our best to try to find out where they are and to collect them. And basically this slide here is if you want to convert um, to uh, centimeters, that's the purpose of that. Touch DNA. Basically, it's anything that is touched. I mean, I like to keep it simple, and that's exactly what we call touch DNA. Anything that you feel that may have been touched by the suspect, victims, whatever it may be, that's what we're concerned with. Touch DNA is also known as contact DNA, transfer DNA, whatever you're familiar with, they're all one and the same. We're going to be looking at non-conducive uh, print areas, and we're going to get into this uh, in a few moments about fingerprints versus uh, um, DNA, what do I do first at the scene? But basically what this is about is, if we know that we have a non-conducive uh, fingerprint substrate, then we got to think about DNA. Then we also have to think about clothing. Many times clothing is left at the scene. DNA can easily be recovered from that clothing at the scene. So if clothing was discarded there by a perp, home run. If uh, at times uh, we, uh, the victim from uh, sexual assaults uh, we must uh, inquire through uh, investigations and interviews is exactly how did the suspect grab the, uh, grab the victim. Many times we'll find out that the uh, uh, suspect dragged the victim by her ankles and she was wearing jeans and we'd like to look at the, um, the ankle region of, the, uh, of, of her jeans. Um, if, her, if the hands went inside the pants, We'd like to know, in general, what area was uh, what did the suspect touch the garment, and, by, and subsequently, it, it, they would look at those areas for DNA. Touch DNA. We're going to be looking at fingerprints versus DNA, non-conducive print areas, minute surface areas, and uh, irregular surface areas. 
And basically what the slides are going to end up pertaining is fingerprints versus DNA. What are we going to, uh, what, what are we going to do first? What are we going to do last? Right now is, I know this is a DNA conference, and uh, Elsie and the crew there will probably uh, quinge when I say this, but bottom line is fingerprints are still our bread, bread and butter, and they will always be. You should always think fingerprints first at your crime scene, as long as well as DNA. However, fingerprints will always be here to stay. I'm sure you read in different forensic magazines and articles, and you saw it on the uh, different uh, forensic file TV shows and stuff, that there's some um, theories out there that DNA will eventually uh, replace uh, fingerprints. We will never see that happen. It is the best case scenario is to get both at a crime scene, and it is highly uh, a, you know advantage to the uh, prosecution for this. So it's a grand slam home run to do both. But bottom line is we must assess whether we're going to do fingerprints versus DNA first. Fingerprints is easy to do. It's very cheap, and the substrates are there to be uh, for the fingerprints to be collected from. But more importantly, the APHIS and SAFIS systems has millions of entries versus CODIS as it is now. So therefore, we always much think about fingerprints uh, first, DNA second. Once we start assessing the scene, what do we do here first, the fingerprint of DNA? Obviously, we're going to look at it and evaluate it for prints. We're going to lift that print. If we can determine that the print is a smudge, there's not enough minutia, then obviously we're going to swab for DNA. You can't go in there and just start dusting everything and then say, oh, I'm going to go back and do DNA now. You must be aware that once you, uh, if you do do that, DNA is now being transferred to your fingerprint brush. You're bringing it from one section of the wall, the desk, whatever the substrate is, to the next substrate. So therefore, it's all contaminated. And we'll, uh, down in a few moments, we'll get into uh, more procedures with that. Your equipment inside a crime scene, you must be aware not to contaminate your equipment. Keep your equipment outside the crime scene or inside the crime scene where you know uh, that uh, it is a safe area, so to speak. Just think about it. If you put your camera down on a substrate and then you're going to process that substrate for DNA, you, and if uh, you're in that right area, you just contaminated your camera and you're bringing it to the next uh, crime scene. If we have minute surface areas, we're thinking da uh, DNA. If we have irregular surfaces a areas, we're thinking DNA. What can we use to assist us on these investigations? I'm sure everybody's familiar with the alternate light sources, the crime scopes. We have them, we use them. Do they work each and every time at a crime scene to help you? No, they don't. You know that as well as I do. However, they're a great tool to assist you when need be. There is nothing better than your, you and your partner's eyes to personally uh, observe what you may have at the scene. Crime scopes are costly, they're bulky, they're heavy to carry up, uh, uh, up large stairs to the um, crime scene itself, uh, for itself. Right now, we have different types of alternate light sources that are on the market, and these are just a few of them. These three is a small little one that's the size of your cell phone, clips on your back, and they're inexpensive. I'm talking about $70 for a blue light versus thousands of dollars for a crime scope. So on a quick jobs, these are absolutely uh, fabulous. Re uh, recovering DNA evidence. There's different types of methods to actually recover. We're going to talk about swabbing and hydration. We're going to talk about scraping, cutting, and submitting the entire substrate. And if I'm being repetitive uh, from this point on, my apologies, but I'd like to hammer home some uh, important uh, concepts to this. Swabbing is going to be your most uh, common uh, type of uh, recovery of DNA at a, at a scene, using hydration. But I'm a firm believer, when in doubt, you cut the substrate out and you submit it into your, uh, into your forensic laboratory. You must keep an open communication with your lab on exactly how they want the evidence submitted. Some labs may tell you, I just want the swab. Other labs may tell you, reasonably, using your uh, discretion and common sense, submit the entire substrate. And if you were to think about it is, is, is that if I, submit, if I swabbed an object at the scene and I didn't send it in, then therefore, if there's not enough epithelial cells on your swab, you're going to get a, um, a, an insufficient amount for a profile. However, if you submit the entire substrate, the forensic scientists can take that evidence, re-swab it, re-tap it, whatever they may have to do to extract more from it, 
and hopefully get a profile. But your most common methods are, once again, is swabbing, cutting a, sw a sample uh, out, scraping, or submitting the entire uh, substrate. What do we use for hydration with our, um, with our swabbing? Distilled water is what we used in the city of New York. We still use it currently. Budget is always at the top of our, uh, of our uh, units, uh, one of our units' problems. But the distilled water has worked fine. If you have the ability to purchase, sterile water is even better. And the best solution to use is phosphate buffered saline. Like to keep it nice and simple, we used regular cotton swabs, paper packaging, coin envelopes, vial containing the distilled water, and a pipette. The key to this photo here right now is the cotton swab. Notice it's a singular swab in a sealed paper enclosure packaging. Because when you're in court, they're going to want to know where did you get your swab from, how was it kept. We're looking to, we must tell them that the uh, uh, that the swab in itself is sterile. It came from a sealed environment, was placed in paper, sealed with tape. Different types of swabs. Cotton swabs, very good. We've been using them by the thousands. They work well. Dacron, there's been studies. Dacron seems to be a little bit better than cotton. We don't know what's out there yet to come out with the best, but a lot of forensic laboratories are doing these studies to find out what is the best type of fiber to attract the maximum amount of epithelial cells from a crime scene. Bodhi has come out with their own Bodhi collector, and what we'd like to say with this is that it has its own cotton swab, a reinforced shaft, it has a reversible square cap, protective tube, and an integrated desiccant. What I like about this is you can swab whatever your, whether it's biological or contact, you can literally put it on a on a, uh, on a flat surface, and the square cap will enable the swab to air dry. You can invert it. The desiccant will enhance the drying of it and forward it to the laboratory. Collection methods, looking at swabbings. On your swabbing, we're looking at one drop of distilled water, and you should put it right off to the crown, crown of your swab, which would be ideal. The next slide is the correct method versus the incorrect method. You don't want to oversaturate. You want one drop of distilled water. If you have too much water, throw your swabs away and go for another one. Too much water, your samples will dry very, very slowly, and obviously your sample is going to be diluted. And the photo on the right is showing you that with the right amount of water, which is one, one droplet, your swabs will dry much quicker and your samples that have the proper concentration. Concerning touch, DNA, contact, whatever term you like to use is, we'd like to have a particular area, and again, a technical, tactical plan on how we're going to swab. We'd like to rotate the swab so that the entire surface of the swab is used. However, do not reuse the areas of the swab if possible, as they may redeposit your samples onto the substrate. We like to use a suggested map Whatever way you can, but this is what we kind of like to do, and this is the type of directionality we like to use on a particular surface. Your next question is going to be is, well, how big of a surface? We're usually looking at six square inches of a surface area, whether you want to use it via a square rectangle or a long uh, rectangle, and in the bottom, that's 12 inches by a half. And what that may be good for is you could use one swab, for a burglar's tool found at a crime scene, such as a crowbar, screwdriver, and uh, so forth. Again, to convert in centimeters and smooth areas. With one area of the swab, using moderate pressure, swab one area of the substrate in a sweeping motion. We want to rotate the swab so that the other side of the swab is applied to the additional areas. We want to go with the grain. We go back and forth like brushing your teeth using moderate pressure. We rotate the surface of the swab to ensure that the same area is not reused. DNA evidence. Gloves, mandatory. Face mask, mandatory. You must wear your gloves and a face mask when swabbing for DNA. Yes, we discussed PPE before with your Tyvex. Some departments use Tyvex religiously, such as New York. Other departments do not, and that's fine. Bottom line is, you must use gloves, 
You must change your gloves after every DNA sample, and you must have your, uh, your mask on at all times. Recovering DNA evidence. Biological evidence, and this is just, uh, we'll go into different types of areas. Biological evidence on a point of entry in a burglary. As you can see, we have blood on a, uh, a window. Hair evidence should always be packaged in a, um, uh, in, in a uh, piece of uh, white filter paper. And if you can, you pick up the strand of hair uh, with your fingers, with uh, your gloved hands, as opposed to using to implements. A lot of times, uh, implements, you got to think about, such as tweezers or whatever, you got to think about contamination. And more importantly, sometimes they can destroy a part of the hair, which will um, detriment the, the analysis for DNA. Assault weapons, such as uh, crowbars, uh, baseball bats, or whatever, you document, you photograph, uh, we went through that already, you take your notes, and you submit the entire uh, substrate. On something like this, I would not advise to swab the blood from it. I would send the entire piece of evidence to the, um, to the laboratory. We already spoke quickly about the, earlier on a few moments about what do I do, fingerprints or DNA or both. Quickly looking at a scene like this, what would we do? We have a patent fingerprint here, and obviously we're going to document that patent fingerprint by taking uh, numerous photographs. We want our photographs uh, from uh, front. Uh, front view using a tripod. We're going to use rulers with and without rulers on our photographs. And yes, you know, as everyone is well aware, you can make an identification of a fingerprint through a photograph. On a job like this is, I would take numerous photographs of this patent fingerprint. I would uh, take my magnifying glass. I would use my um, flashlight at an oblique angle. And I would see uh, that on some of these prints is literally a smudge. I'd end up taking the smudge as a swabbing sample for DNA, and then I would even consider, if I'm happy what I have now, I would even consider about maybe removing the glass, packaging it in a box, and submitting to the, to the lab for enhancement if need be. Going back again to fingerprints, what do I do first, what do I do second? If it isn't blood and you're talking about latent fingerprints, latent fingerprints, again, would be our top priority. I would recover the fingerprint after I'm done mounting it, and I'm sure a lot of you are aware, if you ever messed up on the initial recovery of that fingerprint, maybe your tape got uh, squished together, you can easily go back to that, that print, apply additional fingerprint powder, and the print will still be there. And that's a key thing. And the reason that I'm saying that is, therefore, if the print is still there, then therefore, if you recover a fingerprint on your first shot and you have one that looks of value to you, you can go back to that print, print and swab it if need be. Uh, we've had that uh, on numerous occasions and it's worked very, very well for us. However, again, you got to remember, once you process that sample, you must discard your fingerprint brush because if you use that brush on another surface, you're now going to contaminate it with the DNA from your previous job. And I think everyone's well aware. Uh, we use the same brushes uh, at our jobs, so therefore, from crime to crime scene, as far as dusting, it's the same job. It's the same brush. If you're going to use DNA, you got to discard that brush after every print. Recovering DNA from a uh, drinking container. Best of both worlds on a surface like this. You can easily swab the top rim of that drinking container, discard the liquid, process the rest of the glass. Whether you process via cyanoaculate fuming or just regular dusting, uh, whatever you deem uh, is best, you go forth with that and you can end up doing both on the drinking containers. Door knobs, transfer DNA, very, very um, common. However, door knobs can at times be a headache for the forensic uh, scientist. In that, we're talking about mixtures. And this is where the investment in technology comes in. Hopefully, uh, more and more instrumentation is coming out to be able to separate the uh, mixtures on a, uh, on a door handle, from door handles, as, a, as an example, and it will uh, provide uh, the uh, majority versus the minor component to this uh, DNA sample. It can be done now. It is done now, and hopefully uh, it will be done in the future at a quicker, uh, quicker rate. However, in different situations, if we know that the particular surface, such as a 
door handle or whatever it may have been was just cleaned recently. This is a home run as far as uh, getting uh, uh, epithelial cells from the uh, handle. I mentioned to you before about the recovery of hair using your disposable tweezers is fine. It's just that again, you're going to have to discard the, hair, uh, the, um, uh, the tweezer and you must be very, very careful not to damage it. With hair, hair is more time consuming than contact or biological DNA to, uh, to analyze. Hair, the, a lot of times, depending if it has a root or not, if it has a root, it's suitable for not, uh, nuclear uh, DNA. If it doesn't have a root, we're looking at mitochondrial DNA, which is very time consuming, but a very important part of the case. Recovering DNA as far as ligature, very, very important. Very easy to do be done at the crime scene. Takes you minutes to document this at a crime scene. Takes you a couple minutes to put it into a sealed paper, uh, paper bag or box or whatever you may end up using. Think of ligature at the end of the ligature as far as if it was used to strangle an individual. It's non-conducive for fingerprints, but the ends are certainly conducive for DNA, and we have cases to, uh, that were solved just uh, because of this. Looking at uh, recovering DNA evidence from the uh, window panes again, I uh, kind of went through this just a few moments ago. You can swab your, uh, your areas of the print that are, uh, that are an obvious smudge. Um, ski masks found at a scene such as this that's being discarded from the perp while fleeing. Ski masks, at times you may have multiple profiles. A lot of uh, uh, suspects may use the uh, share the hat and so forth and so on. But the bottom line to this is you submit the entire substrate. If there was blood on the, um, on the article of clothing, such as a piece of fabric or whatever, we would submit the fabric in itself. The main purpose of this photo, again, is Tyvek suits are, uh, should be worn, and I strongly recommend that they, uh, that they uh, to be worn, uh, not only uh, for contamination purposes, but for your own safety. Uh, at the crime scenes, you're stepping in blood, uh, and in blood, you've got to be aware of AIDS and HIV, tuberculosis, and so forth and so on. And so, therefore, you don't want to take that uh, stuff on your soles of your shoes and bring them into your car, your office, and uh, more importantly, in your home. But bottom line is, different areas of the, uh, of the world, um, it's impossible to wear Tyvek's. They can get very, very hot, so climate is an issue. Bottom line is, gloves, glove changes between each sample, and a face mask. You do not staple your evidence when we're recovering it. We always use the seals and tape. You sign and seal. You, uh, you affix unique identifiers to your uh, paperwork and to the evidence so you can use that as yours in court. And well, here's that fabric uh, before. If you have a, a blood droplet on fabric, you, you put it in a paper bag, which obviously paper is the only thing you should put blood slash DNA evidence in. Cigarette butts uh, in our projects back in uh, New York, 86% of our cigarette butts, which were by the thousands, will yield you a uh, profile. So cigarette butts are a must. However, we mentioned uh, before, and I'll get in again, uh, probative versus non-probative. Obviously, if, it, if this occurred in, a, uh, in an office building and there was an uh, outside uh, area where uh, smoke has come out to smoke, uh, this is going to be non-probative. If a cigarette was found inside a crime scene uh, in a private house and uh, the homeowner does not smoke, nor does any of the occupants of, the, uh, of that dwelling smoke, and there was a cigarette there, and that's not my cigarette, I don't know whose it is, this is a home run, again, 80%, 86% of the times we can end up getting a full profile from them. Another example of uh, recovering the uh, 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 biological from the blood from uh, windows and sink traps, very, very important, especially in, uh, in assault cases, uh, especially with our homicides. Um, if we feel that the suspect which was injured, uh, injured uh, him or herself, which is very, very common, uh, especially in stabbings, uh, we would we, uh, use our, uh, our, our common sense and we're, we our investigative uh, techniques, again, with blood spatter, and if we felt that the suspect may have cleaned uh, themselves in the sink, uh, we would end up moving uh, the trap. The traps, the uh, liquid that's in a trap, we usually uh, do not keep. We dispose of it because the DNA, the blood, whatever it may be in, we're hoping that it's affixed to the slime that's on the inner wall of the trap. 
and that's what we look to do when we pull the traps. Pipe bombs. Um, fortunately, uh, they're here, and uh, we've had numerous explosions. Pipe bombs at a scene. Very, very rarely is there a significant amount of, um, uh, of the device left to do uh, fingerprints. But you know what? If we end up getting the cap or the thread area from the pipe, whether it's the uh, pipe itself or the cap, we must think of uh, DNA. And I can tell you we just had a case from exactly what I just told you no more than two years ago. We were able to get a profile from the, um, from the thread of the pipe from the scene. Next, very important, which we've implemented now on a regular basis, we're taking DNA, we're absolutely, or actually we're doing both fingerprints and DNA on, uh, on our firearms, where they're, where they're applicable uh, to do, we're doing them, so we're doing them now by the thousands. And on firearms, basically we'd like to take about three uh, areas of the firearms, uh, single swabs, them being from the grips itself. Again, this is an example of a Glock, and the surface area is, uh, is grainy plastic, non-conducive for prints, but conducive for DNA. Trigger area, minute surface, highly unlikely that ridge detail would be there. Sometimes we've had success, most times not. However, when swabbing, we'll go for the uh, trigger area. We're also interested in the front sight, and that's from when suspects may end up putting their, their guns down their pants. For whatever reason, they're stupid jerks, they put them down the pants. That's their problem, not ours. I'm sure you have you responded to accidental discharges, but bottom line is there's a chance that there is some skin tissue on that front side area as well. We will do the slide, back of the slide where the irregular surface is. We'll look at the magazine. We'll look at the lip of the magazine. Envision wherever you touch, there's possibility of DNA. Those springs in the magazines, everyone in the way, you probably get blisters when you've got to reload them. They're very strong excellent uh, area for, uh, for DNA. DNA and discharge shells, there has been studies. You're not going to get a fingerprint off of a discharge shell. And if you do, it's going to end up being someone that uh, compromised the crime scene, a detective that went in, picked it up, told his boss, yes, it was a nine millimeter used and put it back down on the uh, floor. I'm sure everyone's aware of that. However, discharge shells, the rim area, uh, is a, not, I'm sorry, not the rim, there is a, is a great area. The uh, head stamp is a great area to uh, swab for uh, DNA. Everything that's packaged for DNA has got to be packaged in either pa uh, paper bags or boxes. And that's the point of this. Whether you're using small or large bags, common denominator, paper, sealed with evidence tape, using a unique identifier, whatever you decide that identifier is going to be. Storage almost, almost always must be in a cool, dry environment, never in direct sunlight. Don't put the DNA on the uh, top of your uh, dashboard of your radio car while you're riding around and uh, hours later you're going to put it in for submission. You must, uh, wherever it's stored, it's going to it must have adequate and reasonable space. Refrigeration is preferred, however, it is not required. Your uh, bloody garment should be dried prior to packaging if it's possible or dried at the lab. Once they're dry, they should have a refrigerator to put the biological evidence in. However, your touch DNA, not required. Dry blood evidence, if it's properly stored and, pack and packaged in a cool environment, no problem. Courtroom testimony, you know what, just to sum it up, everyone's well aware courtroom testimony is another uh, subject entirely. My best advice is to, is to everyone, you tell the truth. You know the answer or you don't know the answer. You keep your responses as short as possible, and you only answer the question that's being posed to you. Don't start stretching it out because then they're going to come right back at you. You always want to keep a professional demeanor. You want to be a professional. Whether your protocols is, is that you wear your uniform or a suit and tie if you're an investigator. Bottom line is you want to make sure your uniform or your suit is clear, is clean. You want to make sure that you're well-groomed. You want to make sure you prepared yourself. You have all your paperwork. More importantly, you want to make sure when you go down for uh, your preparation with your de uh, district attorney, a lot of DAs now are, uh, are new and uh, you think that they're helping you more times than not, you're helping them, so therefore uh, you must make sure that you uh, have everything on the table before the actual trial begins. Discovery issues. Every note that you take, 
anything that has to do with a, a particular investigation, whether you write it on a matchbook cover or you write it on a piece of napkin, is, is a part of discovery. It must be produced in the uh, court of law. The defense will get a copy. So therefore, all your reports done in that crime scene investigation are all discovery. Cross-examination, you cannot get upset. Their job is to make you, uh, I, don't, I don't like the word, make you look stupid. That's their job. They want to come up with discrepancies in the case, so therefore that they, they, they can get the evidence thrown out, basically, to give their, uh, so the ability to give their client the walk. Bottom line is, you, you answer your questions uh, in a professional manner. You don't get upset at the uh, defense. Keep your answers short. You look at the jury. You keep yourself composed, and you'll be fine. Any questions? We're going to come up with a few, uh, question area right now in about the, in a few moments, and uh, these are the acknowledgments of uh, different statistical data that I that I had, and, uh, obviously uh, who helped me along with uh, different parts of this presentation. And at any time, once again, if I can assist any of you uh, down the road, give me a call, shoot me an email. Bottom line is sometimes uh, I, I travel quite a bit. I live in New York. I'm out in Seattle, Washington, as we speak. And uh, sometimes it's difficult to answer my emails right away, but uh, I, I promise you I'll get back to you. Uh, I want to thank everybody for their time at this point. Um, again, uh, I want to thank all the participants for uh, registering and for those who actually are online today. And I hope I was able to uh, enlighten you on some facts. And again, it's difficult in such a short time uh, to go through everything. This is literally like a, th uh, a three-day course that we do, uh, including all the practical scenarios and, and everything. But bottom line is, I, I hope you got something out of it. And if uh, you're a, an investigator, a veteran investigator with some time and you've been doing this on a regular basis, uh, hopefully maybe I, I, I let you remember a couple of things that maybe uh, went into a bad habit of what you're doing now. So therefore, I want to thank everybody once again. I want to uh, wish everyone uh, well, and uh, more importantly, to uh, stay safe in your jobs. Take care. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, we've gotten a couple of questions, and we're well, not too short on time, but let's get to those. And um, we're also going to open another poll um, for you, for you all to um, answer for us while we're going through questions. Um, we got a couple of questions about um, collecting a control swab for collection. Can you address that? Yes, I can, and that's an excellent question. And you know what? Thank you for uh, bringing that up. I don't know who did it, but thank you. And I'm going to write myself a note to include that in a uh, future slide. Control samples back in uh, back home, NYPD, and in numerous uh, other areas are no longer required. Uh, with the technology now that's used in the uh, forensic laboratories and the DNA labs, uh, they're not requiring controls anymore, so we won't do it. So again, uh, uh, early on I mentioned to keep an open line of communication with your lab. Your lab may require a control, and a control sample is nothing more but an additional swab that came in close proximity to the area where you ended up recovering your unknown swab from. And the purpose of a control is They'll run both uh, swabs and different types of instrumentation to eliminate different types of uh, contaminants, such as uh, wax and detergents and whatever may have been in there. It's an easy way for the lab to eliminate them. Okay, great. We got two questions that I think are pretty similar um, about the best way to air dry swabs. Uh, um, another they, good question? Yeah. The best way to air dry swabs is Again, uh, the budget was uh, very, very tight where, uh, where we worked for a number of years. Uh, we used to, I used to take the swabs. Uh, we had the, uh, the longer sticks on the swabs that we were using. I would take them and literally put them on a, uh, on a workstation, on our own portable workstation that we would bring into a crime scene. And we would put craft paper on it. And bottom line is, it, it, my point is, it's, it's clean. I would take the um, swab and I would tape the stick, not the swab, but the stick to the end, to the end of the edge of the uh, surface of the work area, let them air dry, and then package them. Obviously, we have them already marked and labeled on what swab, uh, what swab belongs to what, and that's how we package them. Number two is there's different types of drying racks uh, that you can uh, purchase or make up on your own. We took styrofoam, blocks of styrofoam. We made a grid pack, pack pattern on them one, two, three, four, five, whatever you want to call them, and when you had your swab, 
We took the swab, stuck them into the styrofoam block, let them air dry, and uh, off we went to do another task. Come back later and do the final packaging. Okay, I think part of the question, maybe um, the two questions that I got about this were that they were returning, they were swabbing, they were hydrating and then swabbing and then returning it to the original package, but leaving the package open to air dry in a rack, and then once it was dry, sealing it. Is there anything? Yeah, it's always best, and concerning the swabs or any biological evidence, it's always best to try to let them air dry first before doing any packaging. Um, the uh, Bodhi collector that I mentioned to you before, that's designed that you can put in a, uh, a partially uh, wet swab into that container, and it will dry it for you, basically. But bottom line is, um, you sh if you're doing it on your own and you're using a paper envelope, you should, and, and there's no provisions in your container to, uh, to, to let it dry, you should let it air dry first and then package it. Okay. And related to um, hydrating, um, is it okay to use a mister spray to apply distilled water to a swab? Um, I'm a straight shooter. And I must be admit, that's the first time I've ever heard of that. You're actually using a, uh, a spray. Um, it's an interesting thought. Um, why wouldn't I use just one drop of water as opposed to a spray? Uh, bottom line is, uh, I can uh, ask, uh, I'm here at the forensic conference as we speak. So bottom line is, uh, I can ask my forensic scientists if, uh, if there are sprays out there. But bottom line is, uh, if you're using it and you've been getting profiles from it, then uh, that's a good thing. Common denominator is you can't over uh, oversaturate that swab. Okay, thank you. Um, this question is: um, Can DNA be obtained from urine or excrement? And going back to the earlier swabs from anything that comes from our body can get DNA, the answer to you is yes. With the advancement of technology, urine right now, and uh, fecal matter, you can get DNA. And think of it this way. Think of uh, skin tissue. Any skin tissue that, any skin cells, um, sorry, skin cells that come from our body is a source for DNA. So therefore, when one urinates, obviously it's coming through your urethra and your skin cells. So your skin cells will be within the urine as will uh, skin cells be uh, via in the fecal matter. Um, you do not have to submit the entire uh, piece of fecal matter. I know it's, uh, I you know what I'm thinking, but I, I don't want to go there. But fecal matter is very, very common, especially at burglaries. Uh, suspects many times uh, defecate in the middle of one's house and uh, for a variety of reasons. But bottom line is uh, they defecate because they get a high out of it and they send it a message to the homeowner. But bottom line is you should swab the fecal matter Package it, submit it. You don't have to. You do not submit the entire substrate, nor do you let uh, urine. So, if we know that the uh, seed up is in a is in a residence in a residence re uh, bathroom, the toilet seat is up, and there's just an elderly woman there that obviously doesn't put the seat up, then we're going for the urine on the rim of that uh, of that bowl. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we probably have time for one, maybe two more. Um, one question, our crime lab will not test casings for DNA. They say that the DNA is destroyed after the weapon is fired. Is this incorrect? That's false. Um, we've done studies on them. Uh, you are not going to get DNA off the sides of a discharge shell and so forth and so on. But if they do a study on, um, and I'm for, I don't have a study that I can give you to show it, but if you go and do your homework, uh, I will tell you we have done it in New York where a discharge shell swabbing a head stamp we've gotten profiles from. Okay. Um, one more about swabbing. I was taught to swab each sample, one dry swab, then one wet. Is that incorrect? That's not a problem, and that's another excellent point. And um, I would kind of, and that's not bad to do. That's good to do at times. And uh, you know what? Maybe I was remiss not to mention that. However, we do them in such large volume that we try to minimize it. But yes, you can swab the surface with your, uh, with your wet swab and follow it up with a dry swab and package both together in the same envelope. Not a problem. Okay. All right, we'll take this one last one. And I, I, I'm pretty sure you covered this, but I just wanted to be clear on it. Um, if I develop a smudge with powder, can I then swab it for DNA? So in other words, is yes. it? Yes. 
The okay. fingerprint powder will not adversely affect the DNA. Uh, there's been studies, again, let alone powder, but cyanoacrylate and chemicals will not adversely affect the DNA that's in there. However, I'm a firm believer to try to do the DNA first in its virgin state and then submit, but yes to your question, you can still do it even after you powdered it. Okay. I'm actually going to throw one more out there because I want to hear the answer to this question. <laughs> um, any special considerations or tricks when swabbing body surfaces? Swabbing body surfaces, um, we have done them. I haven't had much success. Obviously, number one is going to end up being elimination samples, right? You're going to have to make sure because obviously you're getting the victim's uh, elimination. I have not had success on that. However, I had had success on processing the body with fingerprints, especially magnetic powder, um, recovering uh, prints off of, uh, uh, of uh, not only uh, dead but human beings can be done. You got to be aware of it. The chances are slim to none, but it is possible. I have had homicide victims where I knew the assailant was bleeding, and I try to get the uh, visualize where the blood droplets may have been on the body, and we would swab those. Um, so therefore, if we're looking at biological, yes, you can do it, um, especially, uh, let's put it this way, if the main injury was to the, uh, to the front of the victim, and we have another blood, one single blood droplet on another extremity of that body, I'm taking that, that ex, uh, where that other additional blood sample is for sure, without a doubt. Doubt. If um, I, I, I have not, I'm not aware of touch DNA off of a body yet. Uh, I hope they'll uh, they'll look at that uh, down the road because obviously uh, that would be a great thing. But fingerprints, yes, DNA, I'm unaware of uh, at this point, other than biological, unaware for uh, contact. Okay, great. And I just want to mention that we do have a webinar on this coming Tuesday with um, two sexual assault nurse examiners who are actually going to be covering um, suspect exams. So that question may, may be answered um, from that end um, on that webinar on Tuesday. You can find out more about that on our website. Um, so we are out of time. I want to thank Joe so much for sharing his, um, his expertise and experience with us. We're very lucky to have him on our team. And um, before we uh, all say goodbye, I want to make sure that people know that the presentation was recorded today, so it will be available on our website. Um, give us a couple of days to get that up there, but it will be linked there, um, plus, the again, the slides from today's PowerPoint. Um, feel free to, to share that with colleagues that couldn't make it today. Um, so that's it. Um, please uh, visit our website, learn about our future webinars. We hope to see you there, and thanks so much uh, for your time today and for all the great work that you do.